In the previous screencast, you learnt about the importance of robust simulation within digital design, and how quickly these simulations can get exhaustive in terms of both test criteria and amount of time taken to test. We briefly touched on the idea of test benches, pieces of code exclusively developed to test our designs. In this screencast, we'll be looking at test benches in more detail, ahead of you beginning to design them yourself in this week's lab tasks. So as we learned previously, test benches are used to automate testing of digital designs. In Verilog, we develop the test bench as a wrapper file, which instantiates the design we want to simulate, known as the device under test. Our test benches contain a list of stimuli, or test vectors, which are procedurally applied to the device under test to produce an output. This output is then either collected in a file or displayed to the test engineer graphically. So what's the point of using a test bench? Well, testing and simulation are two incredibly important parts of digital design. Simulation ensures that your design works as you expect, and performing rigorous testing gives a developer certainty that it will continue to perform as expected under any given circumstance. The issue that arises when designing tests is that as soon as you get above a small number of inputs, the amount of time taken to manually stimulate the circuit gets well out of hand. It would maybe be okay to manually toggle wire inputs in ModelSim for a module which has four or five, but for anything more than that, you're looking at getting towards 60 to 100 different input combinations. Not only would this be extremely time consuming, but would definitely start increasing the chance for human error. To avoid this scenario, we designed test benches to easily provide a robust test schedule for designs with a high number of inputs and potential critical cases, and we can just set it to go and run for as long as necessary. So what does the test bench look like in Verilog? Actually, not too dissimilar from a normal Verilog design. The main difference is that test benches are self-contained and therefore don't have any input or output ports. We designed one test bench for each module, and named them the same as the module under test, just with an underscore TB suffix attached. Test bench files are not included in a design's hierarchy, although we do tend to include them in our quarters projects as necessary. In terms of a generalized structure, each test bench starts with the timescale directive followed by the module's declaration. We then declare the module's data types, which are registers and wires to be used as our inputs and outputs, and instantiate our device under test. Once all that setup's done, we procedurally describe our test vectors. This is all much easier to explain with a given example. I've created a test bench for our one bit full adder module from last week. We'll run through it now to get a good look at both the structure for this test bench in particular, but also a general idea of what each aspect of the file is and what it's doing. So this is our whole test bench for the one bit adder module. It's significantly longer than the module itself, but still not too daunting. It's written in Verilog, so you should be able to look at it and get a general idea of what's going on. However, there are some elements here that you won't have seen before, so we'll break this file down bit by bit for some explanation. So the first thing that's declared in any test bench is the timescale directive. The timescale directive tells the simulator how to interpret any delays or timing commands in the file. It's defined by starting with what's called the grave accent, not to be confused with a quotation mark, followed by the unit and precision separated by a slash. The unit tells the simulator how long a delay one unit is, and the precision specifies the smallest subunit available. We can add delays into our test bench code using the hash symbol followed by the number of delay units. So with this time scale, a delay of 10 would be a 10 microsecond delay, and a delay of 0.1 would be a 100 nanosecond delay. We can use these delays to create a procedural list of test vectors to be applied to our device under test. As we'll see shortly, separating the test vectors with delays applies them sequentially. The next part of our test bench code is the module declaration. The test bench module was declared in a very similar way to a regular Verilog module. The only real difference is that as the module was self-contained, there are no ports to declare. So we just declare the module's name and terminate with a semicolon. In the next section, we declare our module's data types. These will eventually become our test vectors, so we have to ensure that they're the right type. Starting with our inputs, these are declared as registers. 
In Verilog, registers are one of the only data types which can be procedurally assigned new values. So we can arbitrarily say things in our code like set value to 4, wait 300 nanoseconds, set to 5, and so on and so forth. Wires, on the other hand, can only take continuous assignment, so they remain attached to whatever you connected them to at compile time. While their values may change as a result of changing signals in the circuit, we can't directly drive them with specific values or manually set them in the test bench. This makes wires perfect for our output values. We only want to see the results of the test vectors. We don't need to directly drive them from the test bench. Once we've established our inputs and outputs, we can then instantiate the device under test. There's absolutely no difference in doing this here than you would in a normal Verilog module. We connect the device's inputs and outputs to our test bench's registers and wires as necessary, and name our instantiation DUT for device under test. With our instantiation complete, we can now start defining our test vectors, and we do this within a type of code block that you won't have seen before, an initial block. The initial block is one of two procedural blocks in Verilog, the other being the always block, which we'll be covering in great detail later in the semester. Procedural blocks allow us to assign values to procedural data types like registers and general variables. As you might guess from the name, procedural blocks allow development for a factor of time in a design. We might want to change values or signal paths across a timescale in a circuit, or in the case of our test bench, sequentially apply different stimuli to our submodule. In order to achieve this, we can't just use the static circuit descriptions that we've been using up and still now, as those are hardwired at the time of programming and therefore can't be rewritten. By using procedural blocks, we can assign new values on things like clock pulses, rising edge of reset signals, or simply when the circuit is first turned on. The initial block runs once at time zero of the circuit, primarily allowing us to set the initial values of our input registers. However, with clever use of delays, we can use a single initial block to sequentially apply all of our stimuli to our design. By setting the values of our input registers, we sequentially apply our stimuli to our device under test. Each set of stimuli that we apply is known as a test vector. Now, as you know, Verilog compiles and executes in parallel, so we need to use delays to force our simulator to apply each test vector sequentially. When the simulator sees a delay within the code, it holds the simulation for that number of time units before continuing on until it reaches another delay or a stop function. In this example, I've manually written all test vectors for the adder for a carry-in value of zero. It's only two inputs which need varying, so it didn't take me very long. But what about when we've got to write a test bench for a file with many inputs? We can't be expected to program all of our test vectors by hand. This is where we have to tap into a bit of behavioral Verilog ahead of time, using a construct which should be familiar to you, a for loop. By using a for loop in our test bench design, we can programmatically generate our test. Firstly, our for loop needs to use an integer to use as a loop variable. In Verilog, we can't just declare these in line like we would in C++, so we have to declare it outside of the initial block. Inside the for loop, I've stuck inputs B and A together using a concatenation command, so that they can be easily assigned values as the loop iterates. Now, when the test bench compiles, the for loop will run for four iterations, automatically generating all of our test vectors and applying them directly to the submodule. The final bit of code that you see here is a stop function. It's a command that, as you might guess, tells the simulator to stop running. We can add code in our test bench to give the simulator instructions as it compiles. These instructions have quality of life things such as stopping the simulation at a given point and displaying values in the log window. These instructions do absolutely nothing in a non-test bench file, so shouldn't be used elsewhere. You can't use them like printf statements in a Verilog design file. For the next couple of weeks, we'll be using the stop and display commands to improve the readability of the output of our test benches. Always remember to include a stop command at the end of every test bench, otherwise it will run forever and you'll complain that your software has crashed. 
So that covers just about everything you need to know about test benches for now. We'll revisit things like procedural blocks and writing to files later on in the semester, but with the skills detailed here, you should be able to get started on small test benches for the designs we've been working on for the past couple of weeks. A great resource for test bench design is the website testbench.in. It covers everything from design concepts and syntax all the way to proper industrial design standards, so it's well worth taking a look at if you want to see how in-depth you can get as a test engineer.